Well, we got another one burning, and Jackson and Johnson are on sick leave. We're short of people again. Uh, excuse me, do you know how to get to... What's your name? James. Hey, you ever use a parachute? No way. Ah, it's just like learning to walk. Nothing to it. Dick here will give you some tips. <coughs> You're kidding, right? Crazy? Of course. But not much crazier than this. Hensler and Washington are on leave. The crew's way too short. Excuse me, can you tell me how to What's get to... What's your name? Oh, uh, not again. You ever use a pair of these? Boots? Yeah, once or twice. That's enough. Nothing to know about walking in the wilds. Here, put these on. Uh, when will we be back? What's there to know about walking? When you're walking wildlands for a living, the answer is plenty. In the next 20 minutes, you'll see three crews showing the right combination of judgment and techniques. By walking smart, you can meet the challenge of working in the wilds, whether you're walking up, across, or down, you'll be better able to stay on your feet, cover more country, and be more in control. And you'll know what to do to save yourself if you do slip or fall on or off the job. So let's see the methods experts use to safely walk the wilds. Experienced crews know that safety in the wilds starts before you even get off the road. Physical and mental readiness are needed. These days, all athletes understand the importance of warming up. Think of yourself as an athlete. The work you do requires skill, strength, and endurance the moment you step off the road. Recreational exercise like hiking, skiing, and mountain biking is good conditioning for project work. And a couple of minutes of simple stretching warm-ups prepare your knees, hips, and back to react fast and sure. The morning tailgate meeting gives you important project and safety information, but don't stop there. Keep alert to the weather and walking conditions. Experienced woods walkers realize that no two climbs are the same. Right off, they start scanning the whole slope and figuring the best route to their work site. Once you've decided on your route, now is the time to select the best footing methods for the terrain. Look for natural paths and figure your way around hazards like logs or rock that could roll away on you or other crew members. For example, on bare cut slopes, you can encounter a variety of conditions, from soft ground to sheer rock. The right method, either friction or edging, reduces slipping and saves you energy, too. Use friction when you're climbing moderate slopes where traction is good, on solid ground, rock, or logs. Just keep as much of your boot as possible in contact with the ground. Relax your ankles so that you're walking on your entire foot, not just your toes. The more boot sole you have touching the ground, the better the friction to keep you from slipping. But friction doesn't work well on scree, snow, ice, or mud, slippery vegetation, or extreme slopes. These are the places to make edging work for you. To do this, concentrate your weight, either on naturally occurring footholds, or footholds you create by digging into soft surfaces with the toe, side, or heel of your boot. When you're going straight up a slope, you can herringbone by walking with your toes pointed out and lightly stomping the inside edges of your boots into the hill. Or you can toe kick straight into soft surfaces to create a firm foothold. How well you can use any footing technique depends on two key elements, good boots and strong balance. First, for summer project work, make sure you have a sturdy leather boot that gives firm and flexible ankle support. For greatest comfort, get boots large enough to accommodate two pair of socks without feeling tight. The sole construction should provide maximum traction in a variety of conditions, and remember, it should be stiff enough to give you good support even on small footholds. A boot with a lug sole and logger heel is a good all-around choice. Check with your supervisor. Some units have their own requirements regarding boots. 
but you'll have more comfort and control by wearing the right boots. Your other key to good footing is keeping your weight balanced over your arches. Many people lean into the hill when they're climbing, thinking it's easier or safer this way. But in reality, this can cause you to lose your footing and work harder. An excellent way to stay strongly balanced is to keep your crown from sliding off. People often tilt their head too much when they're looking down for a foothold or up at where they're going. Looking down this way makes you lean too far out over your toes. Likewise, tilting your head way back to look up can set you up for a backward tumble. For best balance, imagine your hard hat is a crown that's worth a month's pay. You don't want it to slide off forward or back. So, like an expert skier, look up or down with your eyes as much as possible, not your head. The basics of preparation, route finding, good footing, and strong balance put you more in control on any slope. Some people have the knack for coming out safe day after day. It's more than good luck. They've developed a relaxed but alert attitude and skilled judgment. You probably know that most serious walking accidents happen going downhill. On easy downhill slopes, most people walk the same way they do on level ground. This makes their knees overextend during part of their stride. So, minor stumbles over exposed roots and other obstacles are more frequent and often result in ankle and knee sprains. Expert walkers put extra bend in their knees and walk a little lower to the ground whenever they're going downhill. It becomes second nature, partly because it's easier as well as safer. But on steep slopes, serious sliding or falling accidents are all too common. While it may be the shortest route, going straight down the fall line is usually dangerous and tiring. The fall line is the direction a ball would roll away from your feet. When the going gets steep, expert walkers, like skiers, prefer traversing down the fall line to control their speed and reduce fatigue. Besides traversing, two techniques give the standout walker that extra measure of balance and endurance on steep slopes. One is the rest step. Try it this way. Place your foot on a reliable foothold. Then put plenty of bend in your knees and shift your weight forward. Now here's the secret. Insert a momentary pause before your next step. It's this pause that saves energy and sets you up to control each step. A second technique is to sidestep when you have to go straight down the fall line. In this position, you can best control your balance if you slide. One key point here, don't let your uphill foot cross below your downhill foot. Because in this position, it's almost impossible to recover when you unexpectedly lose your footing. Done right, it's similar to the rest step. You keep your weight on the uphill foot. Check out the downhill foothold. Then, transfer your weight and bring your uphill foot down like this. Having plenty of bend in your knees is critical. Traversing, rest stepping, and side stepping will really help you stay on your feet. But chances are you're going to slip off your feet sometime or other. When you do, there are several techniques you can use to help save yourself. Let's look at two now. You'll see the rest later. First, on steep slopes, carry sharp tools like Sandvix in your downhill hand. Remember to switch hands when you reverse direction. This way, when you slip, you won't fall on your tool. And you can chuck it if you need to. All too often, when people slip, they end up landing on their tailbone, or even worse, banging their head. You can minimize injury by taking the force of the fall on large muscle groups like your thighs, lats, and forearms. To help save yourself, it makes most sense to protect your head first, then your spine, internal organs, and finally, your joints like elbows and knees. To protect your head and avoid falling on your tailbone, pin your collar to the uphill side the instant you slip or fall. Here's why. When you're in the air, if you look to your right, your body twists the same direction. As you can see here, facing downhill could cause you to go head over heels or land flat on your back. So, by pinning your collar to the uphill side, you land in a better position to protect your head and spine and to arrest your slide. 
A good way to learn this technique is to stand at the bottom of a slope in a sidestep position. Take a moment. Slowly pin your collar so that you're looking at your armpit on the uphill side. Be sure to press your chin, not your cheek, to your collarbone. Now do some mental rehearsal. Imagine your feet starting to slip out. Quickly pin your collar just the way you see it being done on screen. Think through this technique before you start down a steep slope or before mountain biking, hiking, or skiing downhill. You'll be set to save yourself when the time comes. Most experienced people can tell you stories about embarrassing falls and serious injuries that happened while crossing creeks and streams. Sometimes, just getting down to the creek can be tough, what with heavy underbrush or brambles and poor footing. One way to increase your control here is to rely on your power fingers when you need maximum holding power and balance. It's simple. Grab onto handholds and tools you're carrying by putting extra strength into your ring finger, little finger, and thumb. These are your power fingers. You may have discovered this already if you've tried chin-ups and pull-ups. Chin-ups are easier. Ever wonder why? With pull-ups, you're mostly holding on with these two fingers and thumb. On the other hand, when you do chin-ups, you tend to grip with these fingers, which maximizes your leverage and strength. Remember to reach, grip, and carry with your whole hand, but put a little extra strength in your last two fingers and thumb. Power fingers make you stronger and at the same time improves your balance because it automatically creates a better connection to your hips, which is your center of gravity. Now, when you do get down to the creek, there are three basic ways to get across if there isn't a bridge or a cable. The first is stepping into the water and fording it. The second is finding a log. And the third is picking your way across rock to rock. If you're thinking of fording, check out the stream flow and how deep the water gets. You can measure the current by dropping a leaf or twig on the water while counting 1001, 1002. If the leaf moves eight feet or more in one second and the water gets near knee deep, then wading across is too dangerous. To judge how deep the creek bottom really is, poke a stick into the water to test the spot you plan to step to, but don't depend on the stick for balance. Logs often make convenient natural bridges. Look for logs with branches that offer good handholds, but be alert, check how tight the bark is, and look for other signs of rot or weakness. Some of the hardwoods, like birch and alder, have bark that tends to break away underfoot. Even cork boots won't help here. Some of the same techniques you've already seen will also help you when you're crossing. Again, put extra bend in your knees, turn your toes slightly out, and keep your crown from sliding off. You can also put heavy items in the bottom of your pack to keep your center of gravity low. But if walking a particular log feels perilous, definitely listen to your inner voice. Find another route, or cross in a safer way, like scooting. Think of scooting as the human version of getting four-wheel drive traction, and it gives you the lowest possible center of gravity. Even if you do slip off a log, you've got four more methods for protecting yourself. First, plan your crash in advance. Figure out where you'd rather land. It's just common sense. It's more painful to fall onto a sharp stub than on open ground. And it's much safer to land feet first than on your head. Be ready to pin your collar toward your chosen landing spot. Second, quick sit. Third, make a forearm shield. And fourth, curse the fall. Let's examine how these work. The quick sit is just that. Suddenly sit halfway down, knees together. This is a parachuting technique that keeps your legs in position to serve as a strong shock absorber. 
Keeping your legs together is important because it helps protect you from serious knee and ankle injuries, and it reduces the chance of straddling a branch or log on the way down. To make a forearm shield, chuck your tools away and bring your elbows in tight. This way, the muscles of your forearms protect your chest and face from harm, and you're less likely to bash an elbow or dislocate a shoulder. Last, cursing the fall as you hit the ground releases breath, thereby transferring the force of impact out of your chest and abdomen. So as you fall, scream. Scream anything you want, but scream it all the way down. You can program yourself to react the right way by practicing these techniques without really falling. Imagine you're standing on a log and you start to fall. Pin your collar and quick sit. Then try it again, adding the forearm shield and cursing the fall. Don't worry about grace and perfection. During a fall, to whatever degree you use these techniques, you'll improve your odds of escaping serious injury. But the most common way to get across a creek is from rock to rock. Experienced crew members realize there are many hazards here. Mud on your boots, wet moss, and unsteady rocks are just a few. When you have to jump, be ready to use the fall safe techniques you've just seen. Sometimes it's better to find another route. And there are even times when not crossing is the right choice. For example, Toward the end of the day, when you're tired and the light is poor, or when it's cold enough that getting wet could lead to hypothermia. Judging when and how to cross protects both you and your co-workers. Everyone knows that urge to get back to the rig at the end of the day. Okay, it's time to go. Let's get our gear together. But experienced walkers are aware that the downhill trek back to the vehicles is one of the most hazardous times of the day. Most everyone is feeling tight muscles or some fatigue from a good day's work. A recent National Football League study revealed that lots of injuries happened in the first two minutes after halftime. Why? Because while players warmed up before the start of the game, they didn't warm up again after cooling down during the halftime. But, when players began warming up before the second half, injuries went down sharply. So, after breaks, and especially before starting back to your rig, do some light leg and back stretches. Other sports medicine studies show that compared to climbing, going downhill is much more stressful on your feet, knees, hips, and back. Downhill treks often bring on blisters and shin splints. But there are some simple things you can do to avoid these and other problems. First, wear two pairs of socks, a thick, well-padded outer sock over an inner sock that wicks moisture away from your feet. This really reduces your chance of getting foot sore or blistered. And being less foot sore means you're more agile on the move. Second, and just as important, remember to walk with plenty of bend in your knees to reduce the pounding that causes shin splints and muscle fatigue. One more tip. The ground, close to a very steep drop-off, is often unstable and can give way without warning. So start sidestepping a few feet before you get to the edge. But even if you do everything right, you still may slide down a cut slope or other steep hillside. Some people make the mistake of running straight down the fall line as a way to stay on their feet. Unfortunately, this usually makes the situation worse and often results in serious accidents, even fatalities. If you're sidestepping to start with and you begin to slide, you can try a traversing run out. How can you tell if this is working? At first, you'll gain a little speed, then smoothly slow down as your run levels out. But if you're not losing speed fast, things are definitely getting worse and it's time to try your second option. Try to arrest your slide by creating more friction Go down on your side or turn completely onto your front. Bend your knees slightly to act as shock absorbers in case you slide into something hard. You may get bruised, but you can arrest all but the most severe slides by going down on your side or front. One note, if you happen to be sliding down a grassy or brushy slope, it's better to slide belly down so you can grab for hunks of grass or branches that will help stop you. Another point here, you can armor yourself against cuts and bruises by wearing gloves, a long sleeve shirt, and by loading your pack so that soft items are next to your back. 
During the last 20 minutes, you've seen many methods used by expert walkers to meet the challenges of working in the wilds. By knowing the dangers, making the right judgment calls, and using proven physical techniques, you'll be able to cover more territory, be safer, and stay more in control on and off the job.